This section, Pneumatology 4, is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, or literally faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, Galatians 5, 22-23. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, and righteousness and truth, Ephesians 5, 5, 9. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life, Romans 6, 22. This is the practical manifestation of the Christian life, the character that gives the evidence of the reality of the life of Christ within you. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 6, B through 20, Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. The fruit of the Spirit is the true characteristic of the Christian life. The blessed man of Psalms chapter 1 is said to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. Psalm 1 3. The principal purpose for a tree is to bring forth fruit, and Jesus had no place for a tree that did not produce fruit. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon. But leaves only, and said to it, Let no fruit go on thee henceward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Matthew twenty one, eighteen, nineteen. Every branch of me that bears not fruit, he takes away. John fifteen two. The fruit of the Spirit, again, is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance in Galatians five, twenty two and twenty three. True Christian virtues are the fruit of the Spirit and not of the human effort. If we have the fruit of the Spirit, then we have the Spirit. And we can only achieve fruit-bearing by abiding or living in cooperation with the indwelling fruit-bearer. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ produced by the Spirit of Christ in the follower of Christ. The more one has of the Spirit's presence, the more emphatic will be the manifestation of the fruit in his living and working. Uh, a lot of people try to endeavor to produce fruit of spirit through the natural process of character building, such as the exercise of will, aesthetic culture, mental science, the pursuit of philosophy, education, ethics, all of which is very commendable from the human point of view. It is much better to be moral, ethical, cultured, well-informed, decent, friendly, honorable, and patient than to be the opposite. However, these above-named virtues achieved by purely human effort are not the fruit of the Spirit, but an imitation thereof. They are wax fruit in contrast with real fruit. Just as beautiful as the real to view from a distance, but immeasurably inferior to the ta taste. When Jesus Christ is fully formed in the believer by the indwelling spirit, the true Christ-like virtues will be the natural result, a result as natural as that as the growth of apples on the apple tree. If he is devoid of fruit, he is obviously devoid of the spirit of Christ. Paul's list of characteristics of the fruit is actually the Sermon on the Mount in a nutshell. 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians is merely the extension of Galatians 5, 22 and 23. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. And in Philippians, Paul emphasizes, Finally, brethren, whatever soever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4, 8. If the, any pattern, uh, any concept, any person who calls himself a Christian and does not have as its pattern of character the fruit of, 
Holy Spirit is not walking in the truth. It is false. The greatest treasure of the believers, the golden chain composed of nine precious links on which is engraved the fruit of the Spirit, <clears throat> whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1, 4-8 all right, let's look at the contrast between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. The list of graces of the fruit of the Spirit that we read in Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is preceded by what Paul calls the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, Strive, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in the time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19-21. So the fruit of the Spirit is made manifest and the fruit of the flesh also. A spirit-filled man, man can be distinguished by this fruit, in contrast to the carnal, carnal man, which is identified by his works. A believer's character is called fruit. The carnal unbeliever is, the fleshy man is called works. <clears throat> the struggle in the personality is a struggle between the self and Christ. If the self wins, self becomes the center of the personality and the person becomes self-centered. If Christ wins, he becomes the center of the personality, and the person is Christ-centered. The result of an ego or self-centered life is the manifestation of the works of the flesh. The result of a Christ-centered life is the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> so it is apparent the difference between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Flesh produce works, spirits produce fruit. One requires self-effort, the other requires no effort of the flesh. One is the product of the factory, the other is the garden. One is dead, the other is alive. One is of the flesh, the other of the spirit. Let's go on and look at the secrets of fruit bearing. John 15, 1-8 teaches us the importance and secrets of fruit bearing. Those who have no fruit are cast forth as a branch and is withered, verse 6. Others are described as having fruit, more fruit, and much fruit, and fruit that abides. Fruit that he referred to is the fruit of the Spirit, the true essence of spiritual life. Of course, the first secret of fruit bearing is abiding in Christ. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I am him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Verse 4 and 5. The fruit bearing is the result of the life of Christ, the vine flowing through the life of the believer. Without me, or apart from me, you can do nothing. Therefore, we, the branch must abide in the vine. It is important to realize that the fruit of the Spirit is not directly the result of the baptism of the Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit abiding, it, abiding in him, and as he continues to abide in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit will be experienced in his life. One who is full of the Holy Ghost will experience more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. But this comes from abiding in Christ. The the fruit does not come as a result of the baptism with the Spirit, but of abiding in Christ. This explains why some who receive the baptism with the Spirit may not be manifesting the qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. 
Many who are baptized with the Spirit fail to go on to live life in the fullness of the Spirit. Many of the Galatians, as well as some of the Corinthians, Corinthians had the Pentecostal anointing, and yet they were devoid of love. Many people have experienced fullness at one time, but were not living in the fullness of abiding. The crowning attainment is a daily spirit-filled life, abundant in the fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit who abides in us is grieved and quenched, if we walk in the flesh rather than in the Spirit, we can expect a fruitless life. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, verse 2. These just refers to Christians or those who became such, not to mere professing believers. The expression in me clearly shows that some are taken away for failure to produce fruit were originally two branches in the vine, but did not continue in contact with the source of life long enough to bear fruit. Verse 5 says, you are the branches. So for those people who say once saved are always saved, that God would like us to believe that God rejects only the fruit of the apostate, but not the man himself. Nevertheless, the word says that the reprobate branch is removed and cast into the fire because it bears no fruit. It's not unreasonable to expect fruitfulness of the believer inasmuch as it were God who provides the elements for it. The believer has one sole responsibility, which is to abide in Christ, and the fruit is the natural product of abiding. The second secret of fruit bearing is every branch that bears fruit, he purges that it may bring forth more fruit. This suggests the process of pruning. Every branch that does not bear fruit is taken away. But the branch that does bear fruit is pruned that it might bear even more fruit. The pruning process in the life of a sincere Christian is never an easy one. It suggests chastening and no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are ex exercised thereby. Hebrews 12.11 Leaves may be plentiful, but seldom produce fruit. And the Lord sometimes must coat away some of the leaves of self-indulgence from the life of the Christian that he might bear more fruit, even much fruit. Lest he should have a tendency to draw back from this disciplining of his life, let the believer remember that Jesus said, My father is the husbandman, John 15, 1. He's the one who holds the knife and the pruning shears, and we must safely trust ourselves to his loving care. What does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, a branch is an integral part of the vine and must not be severed from the vine. So we must be in unbroken fellowship with him. And this relationship is sustained by unwavering faith in what Christ has done for you and what you are in Christ. You must rejoice continually in the saving grace of Jesus and constantly realize that he is redeemed, justified, born into the, we are born into the family of God, placed as a son and heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And because of these glorious realizations, then we should be constantly thankful to the Father in praise and communion and prayer and conscious fellowship with the Lord. And we will consciously endeavor to, to, to abide in the Holy Spirit, to obey his commands, and to walk in his will. He must live in the Spirit, Galatians 5.25, be led of the Spirit, Galatians 5.18, and walk in the Spirit. Now let's look at the difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in this section. And then we shall endeavor to go on and go into more detail about the fruits of the Spirit. It's, it's vitally um, important that you understand the relationship between spiritual life and ministry. One is not a substitute for the other one. No one must, must ever say, as some have, I do not believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but I believe in love. The gifts have their place and the fruit have its place, but they are entirely different categories of spiritual blessing. Now note the following differences between these two. The gifts of the Spirit have to do with spiritual capabilities, what one can do in the service of the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit has to do with spiritual character, what one is in the Lord. The gifts are received as a result of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. 
The fruit is the result of the new birth and abiding in Christ. Gifts are received instantly while the fruit develops gradually. Gifts of themselves are not a mean of judging the depths of one's spiritual life. But the fruit is the basic criteria of the development of spiritual life and character. There are varieties of gifts, but there's only one fruit of the Spirit. All right, spiritual gifts indicate spiritual capabilities, while the fruit denotes spiritual character. People are endowed with many gifts and talents at birth. No one could excel in life, with, in life without these, for example, art or music. Jesus used the parable of the talents and the pounds to indicate that certain men were given these talents to use and they will be held responsible. In the spiritual realm, the Holy Spirit, as its divine choosing, bestows certain spiritual capabilities to be used in spiritual service. The fruit of the Spirit has nothing to do with what a person may be able to do in the service of the Lord. As we shall see, it will not have a great deal to do with what he does for the Lord, but how he does it. All right. The gifts of the Spirit are bestowed by the Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. These divine abilities are apparently given virtually instantly. The, um, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost suddenly, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2, 4. It seems one moment they were not... Uh, able to speak with tongues, and the next they were. Acts 19.6 confirms this, for we, we read of the believers at Ephesus, and when Paul had laid his hands upon him, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Fruit, on the other hand, is always the result of slow, gradual development. Because fruit suggests traits of character, it would of necessity involve a period of development. There is a tendency among many to look with awe upon one who has many gifts of the Spirit, as though this indicates a super spiritual individual. It is well to realize the gifts are not of themselves the indication of the depth of one's spiritual life. Paul said of the Corinthians church that they became behind in no gift, 1 Corinthians 1 7. In fact, they were rather noted for the exercise of at least some of the gifts of the Spirit. And at the same time, the apostle accuses them of being carnal and guilty. <clears throat> um, there were many uh, situations which evidenced their lack of spiritual advancement. Saul was known for his possession of the gift of prophecy, and, uh, and um, the Spirit of God came upon him and prophesied, but was in 1 Samuel 10, 10 through 11, but it came to pass eventually that um, God would no longer hear Saul's part, uh, prayers, and God the Spirit of the Lord departed from him in 1 Samuel 16, 14. So prophesying did not indicate that Paul was, again, a spiritual man. The measure of the development of the fruit of a spirit in an individual's life, however, is the real indication of the steadfastness of his abiding in Christ. There are varieties of gift, but one fruit of the Spirit. Paul lists nine gifts of the Spirit. All right, the varieties of fruits are listed also in 1 Corinthians 12, 8, and 10, and Romans 12, 6, and 8, Ephesians 4, 11, and 1 Peter 4, 10, and 11. There are many more, but there's only one fruit of the Spirit, which is love. It is really, there really aren't fruits of the Spirit. The characteristics of love are listed in Galatians 5, 20, and 23. Are the, these virtues are often facets of love. The relationship between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. All right. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians that 13 and the 12th and 14th chapters. 12th and 14 deal with the gifts of the Spirit, while 13 is all about love. Um, one person put it very succinctly. It's gift-wrapped. It's, it's, it's gift-wrapped fruit. And that's what we look at. The gifts without the fruit are powerless and of little use. They are nothing, it says in first, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2, If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but I do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Love is the very essence of the fruit of the Spirit. 
So Paul is saying, though, he has the gift of speaking with other tongues, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, and faith, and does not have the fruit of the Spirit, this gifts mean absolutely nothing. This is the inner development of the Christ-like character. It must be behind the use of any gift. <clears throat> this is key in your abiding in the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's go into detail over the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love. Galatians 5.22 Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. 1 John 4, 7, 8. Love is the evidence that one has been born of God. Not only is it the inner, but the outer evidence. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love to one another. John 13, 35. He also gave his disciples the command to love your enemies, good to, good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Luke 6, 27 and 28. This is impossible to the natural man. It cannot be produced by human effort. This kind of love is only the product of the love of God being shed abroad in one's heart by the Holy Ghost, Romans 5.5. 5. The love which the Spirit produces is not ordinary human affection. However sincere, it comes from abiding in Christ and experiencing His love flowing through the soul. Love is the cement which binds all the other virtues of the fruit together into a united whole. Or all the other uh, virtues really are, are the facets of love. It is the common denominator of all Christian character. One cannot fall in love and fail to have, one cannot love and fail to have any other virtue. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with love. Joy, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14 17. Joy is love's reaction to God's mercies, blessings, and benefits. Christian joy is not, however, dependent on circumstances. This kind of joy is evident in the most trying circumstances. Human joy looks at things upon the earth and is affected by the condition of the earth. Christian joy, the fruit of the Spirit, looks heavenward and is unaffected by surrounding conditions because heaven's benefits are unvarying. Joy accepts trials as divine blessings in disguise. The Christian life is a joyful life, and all who would suppress all emotion in Christian worship, who call all enthusiasm and rejoicing emotionalism, do not rightly interpret the word of God. There's not one sentence of condemnation of emotion that can be found in God's word, but it does not teach em emotionalism. Joy is natural to Christianity, and Paul uses the word joy and rejoice 17 times in his short epistle to the fish to the Philippians. Emotionless worship is cold worship. Emotion is the condition of being inwardly moved. Emotionalism is seeking is the seeking of emotion as an end in itself, emotion for emotion's sake. We carefully distinguish between emotional extravagance and the true operation of the Holy Spirit. In accordance with the teachings of this scripture, we exercise control over our feelings so as not to selfishly interrupt more profitable phases of worship and the ministry of the word. On the other hand, we sing joyfully and praying earnestly and preaching zealously and testifying forcefully and giving cheerfully for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 10. When the spirit of God fills an individual, the joy of the Lord is bound to be there for in your presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 1611. Peace. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans 14, 7. Peace is deeper and more constant than joy. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, I give unto you. John 14, 27. Paul speaks of the peace of God which passes all understanding. Philippians 4, 7. It's obtained as being as the result of being justified, justified by faith. Romans 5, 1. But the fruit of the Spirit, peace, is the inner characteristics which manifest itself in peaceableness with others. It signifies freedom from a quarrelous, some contentious or party spirit. It seeks to live peaceably with all men. Thus, the Spirit-filled believer may not only know peace with God, but he may, <coughs> excuse me, he may have the peace of God which passes understanding. 
Philippians 4, 7, because of the promise and the God of peace shall be with you. Philippians 4, 9. Long suffering, which is to say patience. Um, this is not a very prevalent characteristic of the human spirit. Most of us are short of this gracious virtue of patience. The Christian needs to abide in Christ and that long suffering is love and tiring. It is love persevering through the storm and the flood. As each believer realizes how long suffering the Lord has been with him, it will enable him to be more patient with others. For the Lord is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter three nine. But thou, O Lord, art God, full of compassion and gracious and long suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm eighty six fifteen. We need the Holy Spirit for this virtue, as James admonishes. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James one four. Gentleness, kindness. Numerous other modern versions render this word as kindness. Nowhere else in the New Testament translated as gentleness. The word is frequently used to depict God's dealing with his people. They in turn bring glory to him when they manifest the same graciousness to others. Kindness is love dealing with others in their faults. Perhaps nothing more frequently discredits one's testimony and ministry than unkindness. No conceivable circumstance can possibly justify on Christian grounds unkind treatment of others no matter how firm one must become in reproof he never needs to become unkind there is no greater mark of greatness and nobility of character than the ability to reprove in kindness reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering second timothy 4 2 love suffers long and is in kind and is kind first corinthians 13 4 Goodness, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, Ephesians 5, 9. The goodness here references works and acts of goodness, shown to others, practical works of light, love. If a man is good at heart, he does good to others. There is a kind of pharisaical self-righteous goodness, which is more of a blight to Christianity than a recommendation. Selfish goodness is, could well be a kind of badness. Goodness is love in action. It is love heaping benefits on others. The Christian does good because he is he is good. Faith. The, a lot of translators render this word faithfulness rather than faith. It has to do with character as it relates to other. While faith in God and his word is the basis of our relationship with him and the avenues through which his blessings flow into our lives, and what is in view here is the faithfulness of character and conduct that such faith produces. The fruit of a tree is not the tree, for, but for others. Therefore, these beautiful characteristics indicate the Christian's attitude to those with whom he comes in contact. Two thoughts have been suggested from this particular virtue. The first is expressed in the word trustworthiness. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. Matthew 25, 21, 23 suggests the characteristics of trustworthiness. The one who bears the fruit of the Spirit will keep his word with others. He will be faithful to his covenants, promises, duties, and obligations. The true Christian does not shirk responsibility. Second word, trustfulness, does its, um, he is ready to believe all men. You must, um, what, what kind of life would it be if one person could not believe another person? Paul plainly teaches this characteristic of love, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believe all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 and 7. Both viewpoints, trustworthiness and trustfulness, are necessary virtues. A true Christian will neither be unfaithful nor suspicious. Meekness. Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Meekness is slow to anger and take offense. The meek are not boisterous, noisy, or selfishly aggressive. They do not strive, quarrel, or contend. They are not argumentative or boastful. Meekness must not be confused with shyness, timidity, or weakness, which are characteristics of inferiority complex. Meekness, manifested by the Lord, and commended to be to the believers the fruit of power. The Lord was 
meek because he had infinite resources of God at his command. Spiritual meekness is neither cowardice nor lack of leadership. Moses was the meekest man in Israel. He was their greatest leader of the Jews. He was humble and patient, but capable of firmness and great courage. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. Temperance, self-control, is, is very important. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his own spirit than he that takes a city. Proverbs sixteen thirty two. Temperance is true self-love. He respects himself who considers his body to be the temperate temple of the Holy Spirit will exercise control over its own impulses. The temperance is control not only over food, drink, but every phase of life. It means self-control over anger, carnal passions, appetites, desires for worldly pleasures, and selfishness. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 14 says, All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. Profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God has both raised up the Lord and will also raise us by his power. What? Know you not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. In the concluding remarks concerning the nine graces of the fruit of the Spirit, we summarize this with Christ-likeness, the imitation of Christ becoming his divine nature, becoming bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, as it says in Ephesians 5.30. These abiding in the branches, we become vine like, we are part of the vine, and we inherit the structure and taste of the authentic. We don't just look like grapes, we taste and smell and have the fragrance of the Holy Spirit on us.